I started from the beginning with uh, Aristotle's politics, which is kind of the foundation for most subsequent political theory, and pointed out that he assumed that a demo it's mostly a lot of it's about democracy, and he took it for granted that a democracy would be uh, fully participatory and that it would aim for the common good, but that in order to achieve that, the democracy would have to be what we today call a welfare state. Uh, which would ensure lasting prosperity for the poor, uh, relative equality, and uh, moderate but sufficient uh, property for everyone. If there are extremes of poor and rich, uh, or if uh, you don't account, for, if you don't make sure that there's lasting prosperity for everyone, then you can't talk seriously about a democracy. And he went on to, uh, and then I mentioned that that idea was runs right through the good bit of the tradition uh, up until through the Enlightenment and classical liberalism, including the major figures like de Tocqueville and Adam Smith and others, you know, it was just kind of assumed Jefferson and so on. There's another point that Aristotle made which took a little twist in our own constitutional system. He pointed out that if you had a perfect amount, this is kind of theoretical, his discussion in part, if you have a uh, uh, a perfect democracy, uh, and you do have, you haven't granted lasting prosperity to the poor, and you do have big differences of uh, of uh, wealth, very rich and very a small number of very rich and a large number of very poor. In that case, in a perfect democracy, the poor will use their uh, democratic rights to take away the property of the rich. And uh, he regards that as unjust. And uh, if it is unjust, there are two possible solutions. One is to eliminate poverty. The other is to eliminate democracy. Well, James Madison, who was no fool, noticed the same problem. But his, and whereas Aristotle's solution, you know, a couple of thousand years earlier, was to eliminate poverty, Madison's was to eliminate democracy. So he discusses quite explicitly in the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, that we have this problem that um, if we do have democracy, uh, then uh, the majority of the poor may will use their power to uh, uh, do things like what we would nowadays call agrarian reform, uh, and that can't be tolerated. That would be unjust since the goal of uh, the primary goal of government is in his words to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority uh, and in order to oh, and he, he also no fool again pointed out that over time as time goes on this problem is going to get worse because there's going to be a growing percentage of a part of the population uh, that will suffer uh, from the serious inequities of the society and will uh, secretly long for a more equal, equitable distribution of life's blessings. And if they have the vote, they may do something about it, which is unacceptable, uh, not for Aristotle's reasons, but because it would threaten the wealth and power of the opulent minority. So he therefore designed a system which is pretty stable in which uh, uh, you would make sure that democracy didn't function. Uh, that, as he put it, power would be in the hands of uh, the more capable set of men, those who hold the wealth of the nation, and the rest would be uh, factionalized and uh, marginalized in various ways. Uh, so that's one solution. The, the, the problem is real. I mean, if you, I mean, the, the, whether you decide it's a problem or not is another question, but the fact is correct. If you have a democratic system uh, with, a, with large inequities of wealth and the great majority is impoverished and doesn't have access to, uh, to that and secretly sighs for a more equitable share of life's blessings, in Madison's words, then they'll probably do something about it and they have mechanisms in a democracy. That part is correct, which means they will uh, threaten the rights of uh, the wealthy to control the property. Uh, and remember, property rights are not like other rights, uh, contrary to what Madison and, other, and a lot of modern political theory says. Uh, if I have the right of free speech, it doesn't interfere with your right of free speech. But if I have 
property that interferes with your right to have that property. You don't have it. I have it. So the right to property is very different from the right to freedom of speech. This is some often put very misleadingly about rights of property. Property has no right. But if we just make sense out of this, maybe there is a right to property. One could debate that, but it's very different from other rights. And it is surely the case that uh, uh, if the majority lacks the property and is suffering and secretly desires a more equitable distribution, they have mechanisms to do something about it. That's right. And as I say, there were two solutions. The classical one was to eliminate poverty. The one on which our own society was founded was to eliminate democracy. That's sort of worth understanding. Uh, and it uh, you know, takes various forms over the years, but the problem never ends. Uh, and we're facing it right now. I mean, if uh, a democratic society were allowed to function, it's extremely unlikely that the things that are now called inevitable results of the market would ever be tolerated uh, because they simply uh, concentrate wealth and power and harm the vast majority, and there's certainly no reason for people to tolerate that. Against this uh, backdrop of uh, globalization and the growth and, and power of uh, transnational corporations, what actions should be taken to uh, reverse this process? Well, it depends what time span and range you're thinking of. I mean, uh, there's y you read constantly that this is somehow inevitable, no way to stop it, like Thomas Friedman in yesterday's Times or whatever it was, people who just mocks people who say you can do something about this. Well, that's certainly not true. Uh, for one thing, we should be aware of the scale of globalization. In many ways, the, what's called globalization is bringing about a situation which is not unlike what it was uh, when, uh, say, at, at the early part of this century. If you look at gross measures, like, say, trade and investment flow and uh, so on, it's relative to uh, the economy. It's about it's getting back to more or less where it was. Like the one major change is the style of uh, financial flows which is extremely fast and overwhelms governments and so on. Okay, that's new. Uh, but there's nothing inevitable about that. That's public policy. I mean, it resulted from two major things. One, a decision to break down the system of regula regulated currencies, which is a policy decision made first by the Nixon administration, uh, and another by the telecommunications re uh, revolution, which is just uh, the normal form of uh, uh, public... Uh, uh, investment and public public cost and the pub of the public assuming vast costs and risks, and then handing it over to private power to uh, use. But this, these aren't things that are at all inevitable. Uh, it, the fact that the whole system is coming to resemble in many ways what it was early in this century, uh, uh, apart from things like this, that's been made in quite mainstream circles. Incidentally, it's not a unusual idea, uh, th though the differences are crucial, but under control. Now, beyond that, uh, the uh, m almost b about three quarters of the international transactions, uh, like trade, for example, and investment and so on, are within uh, Europe, United States, and Japan. Okay, these are all areas where, uh, in principle at least, uh, mechanisms already exist. Uh, which allow the public to control what happens. Uh, that aside, uh, transnational corporations are also a public gift. Uh, they were created, their rights, the rights of corporations altogether, were created mostly by the judicial system. Uh, they were granted extraordinary rights early in this century. The public doesn't have to agree to that. Uh, in fact, uh, they don't have to exist at all. All of that's within, under public control. Uh, that aside, uh, maybe we've talked about this, if you look at the top transnationals, they rely very heavily on public subsidy. In fact, about, according to the major study that exists, about 20% uh, of them wouldn't even survive if it wouldn't, wasn't for public takeovers. Well, all of this is under control, in principle, uh, up to the long-term goal, which I think has very deep roots in working class movements and enlightenment thought, even in classical liberalism, uh, that these institutions have no right to exist at all. They're fundamentally illegitimate. 
uh, and they're not a law of nature. You know, they're, in fact, their current form is rather reason. Uh, they can be changed like other oppressive institutions have been changed. So, uh, what are the limits? Without limit. But where do you see the fissures? Where do you see those openings where where um, popular uh, resistance can be mobilized around? Well, right now, without anybody calling for it, about 95 percent of the population, which is not small, uh, thinks that uh, corporations should sacrifice profits for the benefit of their work of working people and, the, and their communities. Well, that's 95 percent is a good place to start. Uh, now, I don't see why. Uh, notice that that call presupposes their their right to rule. It says, "Be kinder." Ninety-five percent of the public thinks they should be more benevolent autocrats. All right, that's a place to start. Let's make them more benevolent autocrats. Uh, but I think that same ninety-five percent can easily recover and may indeed already have uh, uh, the a point of view that has been articulated all the way through the working class movements, that they don't have any right to rule at all. Uh, it's not that they should be more benevolent autocrats. They shouldn't, there should be no uh, autocratic structures. So to repeat what uh, middle hands were saying around here about 150 years ago, those who work in the mills ought to own them. Okay. Uh, so we move from uh, the idea that the autocrats should be more benevolent, which is correct and fair, uh, to the question of whether there should be autocratic structures. And I don't think that's a long move.